The fiscal cliff and the health of the U.S. economy is one of many issues facing the new congressional session. Another, of course, is immigration reform. Joining us now is U.S. Representative Ileana ross Layton, a Republican repre representing District 27. She is also chair of the Subcommittee on the Middle East and Southeast Asia. Thank you for being Thank here, you. Congresswoman. Thank you. Helen, congratulations and Happy New Year. The same to you. Thank you. We were speaking to Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Who's a good friend. You know, it, it's interesting. Um, I was talking to her about the need for bipartisanship, and I know that both you, Congressman Mario diaz Balart, also a Republican, and Debbie Wasserman Schultz, obviously a Democrat, have worked together on many projects. Probably all three of you have gotten into trouble supporting each other's projects. And that's it's the not key. popular. Boy, it is. Who would ever think? I would have never thought when I first got into politics that you could get in trouble <laughs> for working with your colleagues because we're not talking about dealing with the Taliban. This is not Al Qaeda. It's a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from another party. And you, you use the word compromise as if it's a four-letter word nowadays. If I were to post, if I had seen Debbie and took a photo with her uh, before this taping and put it on Facebook, I would get maybe 10 negative comments and maybe one positive comment. But not because of her, just because it's a Democrat and a Republican. That means you're not standing up for your values. You're not standing up for your principles. My golly, she's my workmate. But how do you... How do you achieve that? And there's a lot of criticism on the Republican side that Republicans or certain sectors of the Republican Party are intransigent and don't let that. Well, Congressman John Boehner, the House Majority Leader, had terrible problems trying to get just the fiscal cliff deal passed. Is there but a the segment of the Republican Party that's intransigent and needs to find a way to move? Not to the really. Look, we have we have we're people of strong character and strong beliefs, and and we don't want to be looked upon as as people who are wavering on our principles. At the same time, you have folks like Harry Reid, a strong leader, who said to John Boehner, "You are a dictator. You are running the U.S. House of Representatives like a dictatorship." Now, all of us who know what a dictator and a dictatorship is take great umbrage to that, but to say, to be criticized from the Democrats by saying, oh, you are running a, a dictatorship, and yet from your own Republicans to almost lose your speakership by two votes. Um, it, this is it's a rough road to hoe. And, and I congratulate Speaker Boehner uh, for, for doing all the right things and all the right times. And he's trying to find that common ground because most of the people who are viewing us, uh, uh, Helen, they might be Republicans, they might be Democratic members, but you know, they're somewhere in the middle when it comes to a lot of the issues. And these aren't Republican or Democratic problems. They're America's problems. So let's come together. Let's stop being so petty and trying to score political points and resolve the problems that we have. $16 trillion debt that we're passing off to our children. We can't afford this. So how do we find a way to find a common ground to the debt? Democrats say we have to do spending cuts. We have to have tax reform, change loopholes. But we also have to raise new revenue. I don't think that we time. do. I don't think that we need to raise a new revenue. Look, we, we look at just one part of, of the budget, which is a big chunk, Medicare. Right here in South Florida, this is the Medicare fraud capital. Yet what are we doing to make sure that we can cut down on Medicare fraud, which is in the billions, not millions, but billions every year? Well, we need to double the penalties. We need to double the fines. We need to have more jail time. We need to make it tougher for people to have an, a number so they can open up these false clinics and give these false services. So there are a lot of good things that we can do to get to waste, fraud, and abuse. I don't think we need to raise revenue. I think that we need to be smarter in the money that we have. But we need those cuts, Helen, because it, we just can't keep saddling the next generation with this overwhelming debt. A baby born today already owes Uncle Sam $51,000 plus. Which that would mean that in order for that to be, and, and that's considering that we haven't looked at uh, reforming Social Security and Medicare, which everybody agrees must be done in order to preserve it. If that newborn is going to have $51,000 in debt, that almost does lock somebody into a higher tax rate to be able to pay that off without even ad addressing the issue of the debt ceiling, which is just to pay already what that's the right. debt and that's incurred. the next battle you know we just finished this uh, terrible uh fiscal debate 
And now comes another tough battle, which is the raising of the debt ceiling. And I understand President Obama says, we're not even going to have this conversation. You have to do it. You have to raise the debt ceiling. But interestingly enough, when President Obama was Senator Obama, he voted against raising the debt limit. He said to, do, to vote in favor of it would be immoral. So it depends a lot on where, where, where you stand depends on where you are right now. Where you so stand. Does it, does it make sense to raise the debt no, ceiling? No, it does not because Washington is an out of control spending habit uh, colony. We are, we are junkies when it comes to spending. And if you give us the ability to spend more and to borrow more and to get further into hawk, we will. It is like a drug addict who needs the drugs and you say, well, let's give him everything he needs and maybe he'll know that drugs are bad. You give him everything he needs, he'll become a, a, an, an even worse drug addict. We've got to stop the spending. We can't hike this limit. Washington Post unless they cuts. Washington Post columnist George Will came out with an article, a column this week, where he says it's time to to address the uh, the need for an amendment that will keep uh, Washington from having uh, de deficits such as municipal governments and state governments. It would be a constitutional uh, amendment that would eventually uh, ultimately say the federal government needs to have a balanced budget. Absolutely, I agree with that. But listen to how pathetic we, we've gotten to, that we that we need to pass something to rein ourselves in. It's like, stop me before I spend again. We are so unsure of our own spending habits that we must put a straitjacket upon ourselves. Otherwise, we can't control it. This is, this is just binge spending. And if you raise the limit and if you give more revenues, you're just going to tax and spend. You know, sometimes cliches are cliches because you repeat them enough because they're true. And uh, we have a tax and spend problem. It's not a revenue problem. And and so I, I hope that we can rein in the spending. I'm in favor of a balanced budget amendment, but it's, it's a very pathetic state to say we need to force ourselves to do the right thing. You know, uh, one of the things that we really need to talk about also is not just, you know, and, and the Democrats will talk about increasing revenue, and that ultimate very often means raising taxes. But what about the issue of corporate tax rates? We have this on paper. We have the second highest corporate tax rate, but with all the loopholes we have, we have so many corporations that not only sent jobs overseas, which all the power to them, I'm not saying that's wrong because they have shareholders to address, but they also don't pay any taxes here because all the loopholes let them off the hook. Shouldn't we also look at Absolutely. corporate taxes? I so agree that not just corporate. We, you know, look look at agriculture. This is big ag. Uh, when we we've got to stop paying people not to grow certain crops, and and we've got this artificial agricultural law that that is inflating a lot of the prices, and uh, they get a lot of loopholes. Uh, you know, everybody knows that. That you know, the the guys mm -hmm. who have the lobbyists, the ones who are able to walk the halls of Congress, they're the ones who get the loopholes. And and uh, there, are no, there are no loophole activists there for, for children or for the people who are sick. You know, those are the ones who, who very often have to bear the brunt of a lot of, of, a lot of the spending problems that we have in D.C. So what? we need to look at exemptions. We need to look at loopholes. I'm in favor of doing that. And there's a, there are a lot of folks who don't need those loopholes. Why did you vote in favor of the fiscal cliff? You know, we had an automatic uh, uh, date. On December 31 that said we're going to have no longer the uh, Bush tax cuts that we passed 12 years ago they were expiring on everyone on everyone and uh, we voted to make sure that those tax cuts would would be remain now permanent first time that they're permanent unfortunately this is what happened also expiring was a two-year a hold that we had on a payroll tax so in the same week that we were able to, to make the tax rates permanent with, at a lower rate, meaning not raising uh, the taxes, but lowering them, unfortunately, we were not able to also secure the passage of reinstating the tax payroll uh, deduction. And so that meant that when we're out here saying we reduced taxes and we voted to keep our economy uh, going and keep taxes low, people got their paychecks, Helen, and they're saying, why does Ileana say that when they're taking a bigger chunk out of my, out of my paycheck? It is true. That, that pay cut 
uh, did not was we were not able to extend the the deduction of mm -hmm. the payroll tax. I wanted to extend it, and that's why your check is lower. But it's not because of the Bush tax rates. It's because of the payroll tax deduction that we were not able to make uh, permanent. And we'll continue to fight to make that happen. A, a couple of issues I want to address with you. One has to do with gun control. Uh, Republicans are very strong in the Second Amendment. I would say Democrats, Democrats are too. Democrats too. But they look at it in a very different way. Do you think we need to limit and close the loopholes on guns that we have today? Well, I think that the problem that we have is a mental health issue. I, I think, look at what happened, the terrible tragedy in Newton, uh, Connecticut. Look at that mom. I don't want to blame her. She's dead. Her son killed her. But if she knows that her son has issues and is not emotionally stable, how could she have guns unsecured at her home? And you could pass 20 laws tomorrow. And as human beings, we want to say, we want to make sense out of tragedies. And we want to say, uh, well, if we just did A, then B won't happen. Be but sometimes the solutions are a lot tougher to comprehend. And these are mental health issues. These are emotional issues that go to the crux of our In society. Words, for you, it's not so much the problem isn't so much the handgun. The problem is the person who's using it. It's because we could pass all of these laws. In fact, I live part-time in Miami, part-time in D.C. You can't get any tougher laws than D.C. It's illegal to own a firearm. And do you know what the murder rate, ca I mean, uh, uh, Chicago and Chicago Washington, and Washington are very tough uh, places. Lots of murders with homicide. Lots of murders with hammers and knives, too. You know, it, it's, it's a problem of our society that we've got to get real about. Uh, what is going on in our homes, what is going on in our schools, and we wish that there were a, a magic solution like passing another law. Given uh, in, in 30 seconds more or less, given your issue that you've been, uh, you formally chaired the Committee on Foreign Relations and now you are the chair of the subcommittee on uh, the Middle East, Chuck Hagel's nomination as Secretary of Defense, are you excited about it or are you this worried? This is the most dangerous nomination that I have seen in a long time. I know that sounds like a hyperbole, but this is a man who's never met a dictator he didn't like. He is uh, for engagements with uh, Ahmadinejad against sanctions against Iran. Uh, he is for pressuring uh, Israel. He is against uh, sanctions on Cuba, sanctions against uh, North Korea. He's voted that way consistently. And this is a man you want to head the Department of Defense. It's no wonder that Iran said, oh, good. Chuck Hagel, Department of Defense, we think that's a good nomination. That's the words of the foreign ministry. That tells you a lot. So if you were a senator, we know how you would heck vote. You would no. say, heck, heck no. no. A very, 30 seconds. Uh, Congresswoman uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz says that we will have immigration reform this year if the Republicans permit it. Well, we will have it if all of us come together and the president really pushes for it. The president, as we see, he's got the bully pulpit. I'm in favor of comprehensive immigration reform. I'd like to do the big enchilada, no pun intended, but if we have to do it bit by bit, like the DREAM Act and, and little things like that, I'm in favor of that too. If we can't have citizenship and we just have a legal path, I'm for that too. I'm for the art of the possible, and that's what politics is. But we we need the president in on this. Politics is the art of the possible. We're out of time. Miliana Ross Thank Lane. Thank you, Helen Ferreira. Thanks so much for being with us here today.